Good morning, and welcome to North Scottsdale United Methodist Church. I want to welcome you to our time of worship as we gather here today. At our drive-in worship service earlier today, we handed out automobiles to some of our folks who came uh, to be a part of the worship service. It was a reminder to us that even though we seem to be on a charted course wherever we may be driving, sometimes you need to divert and go a different path. The path always remains the same. It's a path that reminds us that it's all brought together. Now we've been tying that theme into our stewardship campaign called Won't You Be My Neighbor? We are all a part of a wonderful neighborhood that calls us to be in that space in which we are called to stay in love with God all the time. We were called to do no harm, but to do good to all. I wanna welcome you to worship. I wanna invite you to, to rest yourselves to settle your hearts and allow for God's spirit to bring transformation and hope into your morning. Again, welcome, and we're glad you're with us today. morning. From Ludwig van Beethoven, we hear these words. My Lord, 
Oh, lead my spirit, oh, raise it from these weary depths that ravished by your art, it may strive upwards with impetuous fire. For you alone have knowledge, for you alone can inspire enthusiasm. Hello. During these times, how can we stay connected with our loved ones? How do we stay in love with them? Well, they may come to the door and we may say, come on in. But you may have to wear your mask or we may want to meet somewhere else, some special place 
where we can, again, maintain our distance. If neither of those things work, we have our phones to keep in touch, where we can call people many, many times. We can use FaceTime. We can see them face to face. We can go to Zoom and see them on there. We need to stay connected with those we love to show them that they are still loved and in our hearts. We also may give them gifts. We may drop them off at their house. We may send them a gift in the mail. Those gifts let people know that they are loved. And what about our God? How do we show God that we still love God, even in these strange times? Well, we can say, come on in. Come on into our homes, our hearts, our lives. We don't have to wear a mask with our God because God knows us, our intricate beings. And we could meet in a special place, maybe a special worship area in our home. And since we can't be in the sanctuary, we may meet in our special places where we live stream. Or we may meet in that church parking lot until we can go into the sanctuary. There are many places where we can meet God and show God our love. And just like with our friends, we can show God's love from us to God by our gifts that we bring. Let us pray. Holy Lord God, it is difficult to remain in touch with our loved ones so that they know how much we love them and we care for them. And God, it is difficult sometimes to show you how much we love you and care since we're not in the sanctuary where we often meet you. Meet us, O oh God, where we need to be met and help us to come to you, to worship you, to let you know that we love you and will continue to love you always. In the name of the Christ who taught us to pray together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we come to worship today, we also take this as a time to remember what we bring to the church through our generosity. This just isn't an act of uh, devotion or registration or membership dues to a faith community. It's really an expression of our generosity and our discipleships as followers of Jesus. Today we want to dedicate those who have taken the opportunity to uh, pledge in advance from today to help the ministries and to foresee the mission and the, the, the ministries and work of North Scottsdale United Methodist Church. We're grateful for your continued support. And we wanna extend that opportunity to each and every one of you today. The challenge to, to make a commitment to give of what you can over this next year. You can do so by going to nsumc.com and click on the tab that says Stewardship 2021. You may also see the word pledge. But this way you can make your intentions known if uh, that is something that you're prepared and ready to do today. Stewardship isn't a one-time occasion. It is something that we are a part of every day as God calls us to be faithful caregivers of the church that we're a part of.
to be faithful disciples as we carry out a mission and vision to provide a safe space for all people and to know that we can come together as a congregation and to give thanks. I want to extend a blessing to you and a blessing to the gifts that we bring to God today. Let us pray. O oh, most loving God, you who will us to give thanks for all things, to dread nothing but the loss of yourself and to cast all our care on you who cares for us. Preserve us from faith, faithless fears and worldly anxieties and grant that no clouds of this mortal life may hide us from the light of that love which is immortal and which you have manifested unto us through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We dedicate the gifts that we bring before you today, the expressions of our generosity, the intentions of what we will try to do this next coming year, maybe above or below, depending on how we can meet those expectations. Most of all is the greater gift of being a neighbor, a neighbor to one another, and to our community. That is the greater gift. And perhaps it's the greatest gift in which we make such a sacrifice to all as you walk alongside with us. Amen. The scripture reading today is from Matthew, chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who is leaving on a trip. He called his servants and handed his possessions over to them. To one he gave five valuable coins, and to another he gave two, and to another he gave one, he gave each servant according to the servant's ability, and then he left on his journey. After the men left, the servant who had five valuable coins took them and went in to work doing business with them. He gained five more. By the same way, the one who had two valuable coins gained two more. But the servant who had received only one valuable coin dug a hole in the ground and buried his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The one who had received the valuable coins came forward with five additional coins. And he said, Master, you gave me five valuable coins. Look, I've gained five more. His master replied, Excellent, you are a good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I'll put you in charge of much. Come, celebrate with me. The second service servant also came forward and said, Master, you gave me two valuable coins. Look, I've gained two more. His master replied, well done, you are a good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I'll put you in charge of much. Come, celebrate with me. Now the one who had received one valuable coin came and said, Master, I knew that you are a hard man. You harvest grain where you haven't sown. You gather crops where you haven't spread seed. So I was afraid, and I hid my valuable coin in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. His master replied, you evil and lazy servant, you knew that I harvest grain where I haven't sown and that I gather crops where I haven't spread seed. In that case, you should have turned my money over to the bankers so that when I returned, you could give me what belonged to me with interest. Therefore, take from him the valuable coin and give it to the one who has 10 coins. 
Those who have much will receive more, and they will have more than they need. But as for those who don't have much, even a little bit that they have will be taken away from them. Now take the worthless servant and throw him into the farthest darkness. People there will be weeping and grinding their teeth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I want to welcome you to the sanctuary space of my home office where we are hearing our message today. The sanctuary is a place that far exceeds beyond certain walls that we call a church. Sanctuary is that place in where God's creation expands and calls us to be in community. I know where you are is a sanctuary space. And what better place to be in sanctuary than in our homes? So may God continue to bless those spaces where we gather today, where we come together in this time to celebrate what God has brought together as the body of Christ. Will you pray with me? Loving and gracious God, you've called us here today. As we continue in this journey, in this time, it seems uncertain. And other times it seems very clear. Be with us today as we hear this morning's message, as we continue to celebrate who we are in our neighborhood, a neighborhood that is beyond the pews of our church and into our very community. 
that can be scary. And so we ask you to walk alongside with us as we continue today to not only respond to the question, who is my neighbor, but to know what it means to stay in love with you. May it be by the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts that we truly respect and honor you. For you give us strength. You provide us with wisdom. Amen. So I'm going to go back a little bit in history, uh, back in the days when we utilized the glove compartment box of our automobiles. We not only kept uh, the owner's manual to the vehicle we were driving, maybe a set of gloves or uh, if an umbrella fit in there, but lo and behold, there was the infamous road map. If we were able to get an atlas down at the side slot in the door, we, we kept a road atlas, providing us a charted course where we travel, or into neighborhoods and places in which uh, you, we may not even know at all. Well, I rarely have ever seen a map anymore these days, unless you're on a computer screen. We've become really suspect to GPS now, that we can just punch in a, a, an address, a location, into our phones, and the phone tells us where to go. God forbid we we get distracted and we go a different direction and we, we take a different path because, surprisingly enough, the GPS seems to correct itself, but it might not be the intended path that it had asked us to be a part of. Especially when it says, turn around, go the other direction. Traveling and being on a journey and path is very much who we are as a church. At our 830 service, we handed out uh, little automobile cars to, to members of the congregation that joined us as that reminder that we're on that journey. Yeah, when it comes to understanding who we are uh, in our own journey, it seems pretty simple to, to follow the designated path. And when we discover that we've veered off from that path, we are still on a trajectory. We're on a course. And it's maybe in those spaces that we really truly discover what God has called us to embrace within our own neighborhood. Edwin Freeman, let me tell you about him. He was a family systems theory specialist and uh, he comes to mind when you think about the, the old family tree and we usually start out by putting you know, who we were born by and, and we just work our way around that tree and the branches representing our cousins, grandparents, and etc. Ed Freeman with another individual of uh, family systems theory, talked about how that tree starts from the top down. And that tree starts with our parents, our grandparents, and so on, and we have them to thank for our mishaps or why we're screwed up in the first place. Ed Freeman was not only a, a, a theorist, he was a rabbi, he was a family therapist, he was a sailor and a map collector. He would also argue that there's a relationship between taking risk and that reality is something that is constitutive. He said when it comes to maps, I guess this was, must have been a little hobby of his, he, when he looked and compared it to our society, that there's this dependence that goes back and forth here or, or this understanding of map dependence versus map knowledge. There are actually two things that are, that are quite fleeting in their own respect, and that are we still relying upon the very risk of new models to go a different direction, no matter how they, they merely or greatly alter the direction or the path that we're taking? He says also it calls us to move beyond dependence and to abolish old models. The very risk of new models challenges the context of experience and, and makes the very methods of conceptualization associated with the, the old model obsolete. It goes far to say is there's not one right way, but there's many ways that lead us on in that journey in which we discover wonderful, miraculous experiences. There's a risk we take this morning ourselves when it comes to the trajectory of the scripture we read from Matthew's gospel. It's another one of those touchy scriptures, very much like last week with the, the handmaidens or the bridemaids keeping their oil uh, in their lamps and those who didn't have oil and they were rejected from the party. And we asked the question, well, what was up with the other people that had all the oil? Why didn't they share it with those who didn't have any oil? 
It's a very, very similar story today. A touchy one. A landowner calls forth three servants. Landowner's getting ready to go on a vacation, a trip. He's going to be away. So the landowner gives to one servant basically five talents of, of earned income. My understanding is basically one talent would represent easily 15 years of a servant's income. Well, the first guy gets five talents. The next 10, or two talents. And then the last one, only one talent. He took off, and as we read the story, we hear that uh, there was some action taken by each of those servants. The one who had been given the five talents to be in charge of, goes and invests that. He takes the risk. I'm going to go test the market, and I'm going to see how that might have some sort of return or benefit for the owner of these talents. The second uh, servant does the same thing, invested in some sort of thing, whether it be the market or a savings account, with the same intentions that perhaps it would yield some sort of return. And then there's our third person. Not sure what his circumstances were, but there was some fear. The fear might have been he didn't know what to expect from the person with the money, and so he just knew the important thing was to keep it safe. So he went and he, he hid it under a rock, kept the same amount. And when the, uh, the actual landowner came back and, and wanted an accounting for, for what the servants had done with his money, yeah, the first person who had invested it made more. And the second had made more. And the first, he still had what he had to show. It's one of those touchy subjects again, because those two persons who made the investment have a, a great return and they're celebrated. And, and it leads to that phrase, to much is given, much is expected. But then there's this last person that had very little. He is sent out. He's cast away and he's punished for not doing anything with the talents he had. I've heard many a message in which the, the preacher says that shame on this person for not using what they had. And, and God bless those who, who used a multitude of what they had to make more. I want to step back for just a moment and ask the question, what was the risk? What was the path that was least taken that, that challenged this person to say, you know what, I just want to make sure it's there when he gets back. What was keeping the, the first and the second servant from keeping um, any information to share with the third guy? Maybe it was their friend. Maybe it was a sibling. Maybe it was a member of their extended family. What was going on in which they withheld and maybe didn't share with them, hey, you've never done this before. What can we do to help you out? John Wesley, when he talked about understanding what's given to us, focused on those three principles, those three steps of living out the Christian life. The third one that we lift up today is staying in love with God. We began three weeks ago by uh, lifting up that understanding that we're called to do no harm, that we're called to do good. And that because we live in the capacity of those two characteristics and passions of the Christian life, we too learn and discover what it means to stay in love with God. And staying in love with God is really a discipline of faith. It's a discipline that calls us to live out our discipleship as followers of Jesus Christ. Now for John Wesley, these practices included such things as being active in public worship, participating in communion, praying for the community of faith and for the greater church, engaging in Bible study and searching out the scriptures and other means of faith. It was a course of living out one's life as they were energized by knowing that they would do no harm and that they were called to do good, to love God and to love neighbor in all ways. It was a risk. In itself, it was a road map, but Every once in a while, Wesley would say, you're probably going to take a different path, but that path will lead you in the same direction or the same experience when you apply the very natures of what we're called to do with doing no harm or doing good and, and how we stay in love with God. 
this whole uh, aspect of love and loving God and loving neighbor has been that, that central focus for us over these last few weeks and for our stewardship campaign as we focus on Fred Rogers' invitation, Won't You Be My Neighbor? To be a person's neighbor is to not only say that what you will do, but it's to extend and to be a part of the invitation of another person. It is to live out that we are called to do no harm and to do no good. And sometimes it really calls us to take the risk that when we experience harm or we experience good in our lives, how will we receive that? What happens if we reject it? You see, to do no harm and to do good might be those very pieces of the path the part of the destination that I wish could have been utilized to, to, to bring that to the third person who only had one talent or to, to take it to the bridesmaids who had no oil. My heart reaches out to that story and says, what happened that they couldn't share with them or with others what they had so much of? You see, when it comes to understanding Fred Rogers and welcoming each other as neighbor. What it first starts with this is we become a neighbor with ourselves. How do you do no harm to yourself? How do you do good to yourself? How do you stay in love with you? How do you extend that very understanding that I too am a co-neighbor with me? Growing up there, uh, we had these little buttons in school that had a, a, a thumbprint and a legs and arms and it had a saying that said, I'm somebody. Of course, it's a play on the word, I'm somebody. We are somebody. We are somebody. We are the very essence of what we make in, in our own identity, but we begin to share that with that of others. When we discover how we stay <clears throat> in neighboring with one another. It's been written um, within Fred Rogers' experience that living in the presence of and in harmony with the living God who is made known in Jesus Christ and companions in the Holy Spirit. It is to live life from the inside out. It is to find our moral direction, our compass, our wisdom, our courage, our strength. To live faithfully from the one who authored us, called us, sustained us, and sends us into the world as a witness and as witnesses who daily practice the way of living with Jesus. I had said that that was a reflection of John Wesley, of Fred Rogers, but easily it could have been, but it was attributed to John Wesley. This whole staying in love is not something new. It's a risk. It's a path. It's a journey. It's diverting the road map. It's diverting from the map dependence to the map knowledge of the basics to realize that there's an undiscovered path that we have yet to take before and where might it lead us? That path for, for Peter, the disciple, was when Jesus came up to him and, and asked him those three questions. Peter, do you love me? Do you truly love me? And he says, yes, I do. And even the third time. But we look at this understanding in which we are called to ourselves to invest our talents of what we have and what we receive to hear that passage for us. My daughter, my son, do you love me? Or well done for, for all of us because we are faithful and good servants of Jesus Christ. Today, we maybe hit a little home, a little harder on our stewardship campaign. And the campaign theme is, won't you be my neighbor? It's not one that I care to, to beat anyone up in the head, and especially during a year like this when trying to understand our own financial challenges has been something that's like walking in the dark without a light. And so we've come to, to walk with one another. And so we still stick to the main path. We stick to the same variables to know that we still might go a different direction. But at least the constants are this. We're reminded of generosity. The generosity of God's spirit for us and the generosity which calls us to give. Several years ago, Rebecca and I went out to breakfast. 
and we uh, were finishing up our meal and a, a woman was sat behind us uh, at a table. And she must have been a regular because she was engaging in a conversation with the, uh, the server and she ref refreshed the memory of the server that, uh, you know, this is where my husband and I always came for breakfast and um, this is the anniversary of his death. And I wanted to come and, and celebrate his life today by having breakfast where we always came for breakfast. At that moment, our hearts were turned. I looked at Rebecca, she gave me the, the wink. And as we were leaving, we talked with the server and we said, we don't know that woman, but we'd like to celebrate life with her today. And we paid for her breakfast. We took care of the bill. It wasn't much, but it was a path of, of new adventure that allowed us to take a, a, a different path, to experience a different reward, but with the same elements of generosity. We do this because we're all a part of the neighborhood may not know your name, may not know who you are. And I may get frustrated when I'm challenged with things that take me out of my comfort zone. But I know as we walk together, God calls us to venture out that we may not do harm to one another, but that we might extend good. And we do that because this is how we stay in love with God and leads us to be called to love others. I want to extend that invitation to you today and the next coming weeks here as we continue trying to understand our generosity for ourselves in our faith. You can go online at www.nsumc.com and click there and understand what it means to, to basically give us a projection of what you might be able to give next year. This can be changed. Or maybe this is the first time that you might have considered what does it mean to give to a, a church? And so you might want to indicate that as well. For some, this could be the most offensive message for someone to be asking you to give money to a church in a time when you're just trying to make ends meet. Then don't be mad. Give me a call. I'd like to pray with you. I'd like to hear your story. And I'd like to be your pastor. I'd like to be a part of your church. A church that calls us to walk alongside each other no matter who we are. We are the body of Christ. We are the neighborhood of faith. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Our gifts can show God our love for God, just like our gifts to our loved ones show love. And as we give gifts to our loved ones in many different ways, we do also to our God. Through the church, we can give our gifts to God and show our love through online giving, through sending our checks in by mail, through giving an envelope, in the offering plate as we exit the parking lot on Sunday mornings. We show our love to our God by the gifts we bring. We show that love to God's people through the way that their lives are touched through our gifts. Let us pray. Oh God, these gifts we offer were never ours to begin with. You are the giver of all good gifts, our talents, our treasure, our very lives. Accept these gifts we offer as testimonies as our love for you and our desire to serve you. In our giving, we make a declaration. Our lives are in your hands. We affirm our desire to be bold in our discipleship not hiding our talents in the ground, afraid to risk, but daring to be children of the light, ministering in your name to the poor and broken of this world. In the name of Jesus, the light of the world. Amen.
I'm glad you could join us for worship today at North Scottsdale United Methodist Church. I hope it's been a moment for you to be able to reflect on your own journey, the path in which you are part of with a community of faith. That as the body of Christ, we are called to, to walk in a neighborhood that welcomes and receives all. To be challenged as we strive to stay in love with God and how that calls us to be loving to one another, to do no harm, and to do good. Thank you for your support, for your dedication, for your commitment and your trust to be a part of communi a community that is safe for all people. I want to invite you to join us for our time of Zoom fellowship. It's following this service, and you can find that password and the code on our website. But most of all, go forward now to love God, to love God's children, to make every day a day of grace as we continue to move forward beyond worship and into the service of the day. Go in peace, and may the peace of God be with you.